impression that got from Tala the first time when I came here was that, wow, the air was really bad, actually. So before I came here, you know, I told my colleagues in, uh, in New Jersey, I'm going to do an air quality study in Kampala. Then the response was, what? Air pollution in Kampala? And in the African countries, are there air pollution? And then uh, when I came here, I figured out there are air pollution. So then what's the, uh, the response uh, to air pollution uh, as, a, as a country? What's the, the response? The response, one way, is to set standard, uh, national ambient air quality standards, set standards. So that uh, you can uh, implement the standard and reduce air pollution levels to protect public health. <coughs> so that's what the uh, the any air quality standards for. And uh, this is the uh, the cover page of the uh, the U.S. Uh, Clean Air Act. And in the Clean Air Act, there are two sections in the United States talking about any air quality standards. Section 108 and Section 104. Section 108 basically is a uh, talking about science, talking about the standard must be set based on solid science, based on data. And section 104 is that uh, the, the, the process to set national It is a, uh, uh, the administrative decision eventually. So section 108, uh, the standard must be set based on science. So every five years, uh, the US EPA needs to review the uh, relevant literature, including the atmospheric science, including exposure science, including toxicology, including the epidemiology, all kinds of evidence, and integrate all the evidence together and uh, uh, just uh, see at what level the air will be safe for people. Every five years, this needs to be reviewed. And uh, one interesting thing is that, uh, uh, look at this work, well, requisite. This is a legal, uh, legal work. They use this word, meaning that uh, the standard needs to be set. No, no more, no less. Must set the uh, just right standard uh, for, to protect public health. And also the other feature uh, for setting national emitter health uh, standards is that uh, cost shouldn't be considered. Uh, for standard setting process, we shouldn't consider the cost. For example, if PM2.5, now the PM2.5 in Kampala is around uh, 50, 60, something like that. But the standard, national air quality standard, or daily standard, is uh, 35 micrograms per cubic, per cubic meter. So if that's the right level based on uh, epidemiology studies, based on toxicology studies, then we supposed to set the standard as a not lower than that, not higher than that. So the cost shouldn't be considered. And this is the, uh, the current national ambient air quality standards. So there are <coughs> six pollutants, six types of pollutants. Um, the uh, uh, carbon monoxide, particulate lead, nitrogen dioxide, ozone, particulate matter, and sulfur dioxide. In the particular matter, there are coarse indicators and uh, the uh, fine particles as the fine uh, indicator, fine particle indicator. The coarse particles, the indicator is the PM10, meaning that uh, the uh, uh, particle size less than 10 micron. And PM2.5, that means the uh, particle size less than 2.5 micron. The particle size indicates uh, the deposition pattern of the particle in human law, and it has a, a different implications uh, on health impacts. Then uh, Dr. Schwander will go into the details of that. So for each pollutant, we have a uh, primary standard and a secondary standard. The primary standard is set to protect public health, protect human. And the second standard, secondary standard, is set uh, to uh, protect uh, Everything but health. The, uh, for example, ecology. For example, the, if uh, you know, I saw some historic buildings in Nepal. If uh, the uh, air becomes uh, uh, very acid, then we have acid rain. Then the historic buildings will be affected. So the secondary standard is set for that purpose as well. And for each standard, for each pollutant, we have the indicators. For example, 
uh, PM, PM 2.5. Particulate matter is a uh, very uh, complicated or complex uh, mixture. Contains at least one million compounds in it. So we only use uh, labs as a uh, indicator uh, for uh, the, uh, the mixture of the uh, particles. And also, for example, ozone. Ozone is an indicator for photochemical oxidants in the atmosphere. So there are also a, a, you know, thousands of chemicals in there that only use ozone as an indicator. And for each pollutant, we also have the averaging time. Sometimes uh, you know, we, we have a standard or daily standard. For, for example, the particular number, daily standard is 35 microgram per cubic meter. That protects people from acute exposure. Then the, uh, also it has the uh, annual standard. The, the whole year average is uh, about 12 uh, microgram per cubic meter. That protects people from chronic exposure. And the health impacts of a chronic exposure and health uh, acute exposure are also different. So uh, Dr. Schwander will also talk about that. <laughs> and uh, again, there's a level here. So at, above this level is not healthy. Since, uh, uh, based on our experience, the, uh, the major air pollutants we can follow were PM2.5 and nitrogen dioxide. So I just want to say a few words about PM2.5. Because PM2.5 is not just the, uh, the unique air pollution in Kampala, it's uh, actually it's a generic air pollutant across the world. So PM2.5 contains a lot of particles, and the particle size might be less than 2.5 micron. And for each particle, each particle is a mixture, it's not a single chemical. So it has a core. The core contains uh, either uh, you know, metals or some uh, carbon uh, material. Then the core is uh, coated or covered by some semi-volatile organic compounds, by other by sulfate, nitrate, secondary form chemicals in the atmosphere, and coated on the core. So each Particle is a, a mixture. And PM2.5 is a, in terms of the size, it has a size distribution. It's not a, a, a unique size in the air. So it has a, a nucleation mode, accumulation mode, and a coarse mode. So the different parts of size reflects the, uh, the different uh, formation mechanism of the PM2.5. And also in the for setting national ambient air quality standards. PM2.5 is a legal definition. You know, in, 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 when we talk about physicians, when we talk about uh, the uh, medical doctors, PM2.5 is fine particles. That's fine. Good enough. Then when we talk about, uh, the, uh, talk about PM2.5 to, uh, to uh, a natural scientist, you know, then this is, uh, must be a PM particulate matter less than 2.5 micron. Okay, then we have the, uh, you know, Image in there because the human human hair has a uh, you know the diameter is a 70 micron right so 2.5 we have a you know, concept in there then the, uh, the the when we talk about the, the PM 2.5 to the EPA it's a legal definition that means particles collected by a uh, federal reference method the federal reference method define the condition the type of sampler to collect PM 2.5 only that type of sample can collect PM2.5 and can be used by the EPA. So this is a uh, legal definition. And also, as I said, uh, PM2.5 has uh, many, many sources from natural source, for example, uh, volcano from the uh, wildfire to human source, traffic, that's a quite a uh, uh, dominant, dominant uh, source in the world. So when we implement the uh, National Ambient Air Quality Standards as part of the, uh, the Air Quality Management Program, then uh, uh, in the United States, at least, we saw a you know, quite successful story. So good things go up and the bad things uh, go down. Is uh, the you know the economy goes up, uh, the uh, you know the, the number of cars maybe go up, but the, the pollution goes down. So basically, that's the uh, the, the result. National living air quality standards. But however, we also need to keep in mind that uh, millions of people are also living uh, in at least in, in, in areas with at least one of the 
six criteria wouldn't uh, above the national ending of the standard. So basically, that's the, the case for the United States. If we apply the same standard here or in China, then for India, you know, the developing countries, then I guess uh, more than half of the people are living in under the uh, non-compliance area. So the health impacts of PRS 2.5 or the health impacts of air pollution, it has a uh, first it affects human law because we breathe in that. Uh, then it can go into law actually uh, participate in uh, uh, systemic circulation. So go to other parts of our body. It affects our heart, affects the uh, other parts of our body, and uh, also might affect the, uh, the viral or bacterial uh, infection. So Dr. Schwander will go into details of that. Then the cancer and eventually uh, mortality. Actually, the World Health Organization estimated uh, more than uh, 4 million people by premature death, or premature death each year from the whole world. This is due to air pollution. So, for setting national ambient air quality standards, the process, uh, first, you know, we, we, we need to uh, the, uh, have a plan, then uh, uh, integrate knowledge, then, uh, you know, do some quantitative uh, risk assessment, then give this whole thing to risk manager, then they decide uh, what to do. But there are two technical sessions. One is the uh, integrated science assessment, and the other is the uh, uh, risk exposure uh, assessment, quantitative risk exposure assessment. The integrated science assessment, the first uh, uh, technical section, basically, uh, let's say, uh, uh, you know, we have six criteria for this, and for each one, it's a huge book. For particular matter, the book basically is a 1,000 pages long to summarize the, all the science in the past five years. So, the, uh, including atmospheric sciences, monitoring approach, exposure assessment, the dosimetry, how people, uh, how, how the particle does it in human law, toxicology, epidemiology, uh, uh, you know, all those integrate together, then basically it's a thousand pages. That, uh, that's a, that is a, a scientific document. And uh, in uh, uh, integrated science uh, assessment, basically uh, the, the integrated science assessment, each book covers uh, a lot of uh, disciplines, as I uh, just mentioned. The major evidence used for studying national ambient air quality standards is that one is epidemiology, one is a controlled human exposure study, and one is toxicology. Epidemiology, maybe some of you know that. Uh, basically, I just uh, look at uh, how many people die versus uh, the, uh, the, the ambient air quality, uh, ambient air quality the, the number of the PM2.5, uh, the concentration of PM2.5 on a daily basis, then uh, using some statistical approach to derive the uh, association. The uh, toxicology is also easier to understand. Basically, in the lab, and doing cell culture or doing the, uh, the animal studies, uh, you know, uh, kill animals or sacrifice animals. So that's a toxicology. And controlled human exposure study. Basically, this is a, a type of study using human as a subject. Um, at Rutgers University, where we, we came from, um, we had a uh, stainless steel uh, environmental control environmental facility, uh, which is about uh, 30 uh, cubic meter. Uh, then the people can go in there and do uh, various type of uh, activities, including uh, reading or typing uh, in front of the computer, or doing some exercise in there. And at the same time, we introduce uh, air pollutants into the chamber. Of course, the, you know, the, the amount uh, or the concentration needs to be controlled, not above a certain level. Uh, supposed to be uh, hopefully non toxic, then introduced into the, the system. Then, uh, before and after people are exposed to uh, air pollutants, they will measure some health symptoms. So, that's the type of a direct evidence uh, to, for setting the national air quality standards. Then, the key message we can obtain from each integrated science assessment or each of this book is the indicator. For example, for photochemical uh, reactive uh, products, whether ozone is a good indicator for that. And uh, at what level, uh, you know, ozone then is safe for, for people. And what's the 
average in time? Is it eight hours supposed to be one day or supposed to be one year? So under uh, well, average in time, it's uh, good for people. And what's the population? Who's more susceptible? Because humans are different from each other. Some people, you know, well, I'm living in Kampala for a week, maybe I'm fine. Although, you know, I feel some of the eye irritation. The same thing, well, I visit my father in China, you know, for a week or 10 days, I can feel that. But in general, I'm fine. But, uh, you know, if I brought my daughter, you know, to China and visit my father, the second day she got sick. So she's six, six years old. So people are different from each other. And the elderly, we also see a very high uh, mortality rate during high uh, pollution episodes. So that's a, you know, people are quite different from each other. So who's the more susceptible population? We also need to know. And the second is the, the risk of uh, exposure assessment, quantitative risk exposure assessment. Basically, uh, we have to use uh, some statistical and physical models to model the, uh, the concentration of uh, uh, air pollution, for example, PM2.5, across Kampala. Then, at the same time, we know personal activity in Kampala and population distribution in Kampala. Then we can estimate people's exposure. Then, based on the, uh, uh, the dose response curve established by epidemiology, then we can estimate the risk. So, if air pollution, air, air pollution for example, PM2.5 concentration, goes up from 50 micrograms per cubic meter to 70 micrograms per cubic meter, then how many more of that we can expect in Kampala? So that's the accommodative risk assessment. So what is the exposure assessment? The exposure assessment basically is to answer all of the, you know, who, how, what, answer all those questions. Who are exposed to what? And how the exposure happens? And where? When? So basically those are the the questions and what's the intensity, what's the frequency of the exposure. And the exposure science is a, uh, a relatively a, a young science compared with uh, physics or mathematics. Uh, you know, mathematics that's a quite a quite new science. Actually, the officially we got this name is uh, in the early 2000. So basically, it's uh, 10 years new, <laughs> 10 years now. Then the uh, Traditional environmental science is used to estimate fate and transport of pollutants in the environment. Then uh, traditionally, the uh, toxicology is to estimate what happens once pollutants get into our body. And epidemiology basically linking from the source or concentration all, all the way to the end, uh, either uh, health symptom or mortality. But we also need to know when and where and whether people are exposed to care pollutants. If no exposure happens, basically this uh, all other things. This is a mistake. Basically, the all other things will be a uh, invalid in inclusion. Give you an example is that uh, environmental benzene. Benzene is a uh, uh, category one carcinogen, uh, human carcinogen. So if we look at the environmental uh, the, uh, the emission of benzene. So motor vehicle accounts for a big portion of the benzene exposure in the environment. However, if we look at uh, human exposure profile, including the, all people, uh, the general population, seems that smoking accounts for more than half of the human exposure. So this tells us what we shall do in terms of the public health protection. Shall we, you know, cut traffic? Or shall we you know, do cigarette uh, smoking, uh, tobacco smoking uh, control? So I, I think we should do both. I, I didn't suggest you know, we, we, we shouldn't do anything about traffic. But this gives us a, another view of uh, what, what shall we do for public health protection. So the role of uh, exposure assessment for setting national ambient air quality standards. Um, one is to identify and quantify the risks associated with uh, exposure so that we can establish a causal link. That's why I said the risk of uh, exposure assessment bridges the gap from environmental exposure, from environmental emission, all the way to uh, toxicology and health impacts. It bridges that. So without exposure, then basically that means no risk. So exposure is a uh, uh, necessary step, all this to establish the uh, causal link between the uh, uh, environmental emission and human health. And also uh, uh, be used to characterize the uh, uncertainties in 
epidemiology uh, studies. I will go into the details later. Um, this paradigm, this is a very busy slide. I don't expect you to, to read it, but uh, this is uh, the, the latest paradigm from the uh, uh, National Academy of Science uh, showing the, the risk assessment paradigm. Risk assessment, we know that uh, risk is a function of uh, hazard and also exposure. Meaning that uh, we know benzene is uh, a type 1 carcinogen. Benzene is very toxic. That's the, the hazard part. The second part is exposure. If there's no exposure, then that means there's no risk. Even though benzene is uh, quite toxic, now you know there's a bottle of benzene sitting in the apartment of chemistry, then oh, there is here. So there's no, no exposure, then no risk. So risk is a function of both exposure and uh, hazard. So this is uh, the paradigm here basically emphasizes the importance of the exposure assessment. You know, then uh, I'll use this uh, uh, slide to illustrate why exposure assessment is quite important for setting national and national standards. Or exposure assessment, why exposure assessment is important to be used to uh, understand the uncertainties in epidemiological studies. The US EPA set national and national standards. Every time, I have, I've never seen, you know, the standard goes up, the number goes up, always goes down, 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 always goes down. So when this goes down, then that means the, the industry will be regulated. And the industry will not be very happy about that. Then they figure out ways to attack the, the EPA. And uh, what they said one, at one time, this is in 2007, uh, in an open meeting, in a public meeting, the EPA must have a public meeting to set national energy air quality standards so all the stakeholders, the public, can attend the meeting and uh, you know, express themselves. So the industry came in, and what the industry said is that uh, everything we did is wrong. So the key message is that, uh, you know, this is for NO2, national dioxide, uh, uh, national energy air quality standards set. The EPA set the uh, NAC standard based on epidemiological studies. The epidemiological studies is basically looking at the variation of ambient air quality or ambient NO2 concentration versus the variation of uh, mortality in this society. So and on a daily basis, then we have a time series, then look at the time series uh, a statistical model, then we can draw a conclusion whether there is a statistically significant association between ambient air quality versus mortality. So this is the happy, happy human model. However, the happy model is based on a central monitoring site. It's not based on personal exposure. It's based on air quality measured at the central monitoring site. Um, a central monitoring site basically means, for example, in KCCA on the roof, if they set up the monitor, basically the whole Kampala use that to read as, their, as the, uh, the indicator of uh, uh, personal exposure. However, we know how bad the traffic in front of the McCary would be, how bad the traffic in the city center is. So the, the, the monitor setting, you know, set up on the roof of KCCA definitely cannot reflect my true personal exposure. So the, uh, the EPI study find, finding a, a strong association based on assumption, the, the underlying assumption is that uh, whatever measure at KCCA can reflect my exposure. If that assumption is, is wrong, then basically all the findings by EPA will be wrong. And uh, the, uh, the industry people are very smart. And if they attack, then they attack the assumptions. So they, what they said basically is that uh, whatever you do is wrong because the NO2 concentration at KCCA cannot reflect your personal exposure. Your personal exposure has no association with the concentration measured at KCCA. So basically that's what they said here. And what they suggest EPA to revise their document is that saying uh, any NO2 levels are poorly correlated with personal NO2 exposure. And uh, there's no association, so you shouldn't recognize that. Basically that's what they, they, they want us to do. Um, so therefore, the central theme of exposure assessment for setting national and air quality standards is to understand
understand whether there's association between personal exposure and the uh, concentration measured at the central site, for example, at KCCA. So the next, I will use uh, some of my research to illustrate the, uh, um, how the exposure assessment can be used for setting national ambient air quality. Again, the, you know, the, the motivation is that uh, EPA sets uh, ambient air quality standards, national ambient air quality standards based on every study. And in every study, people use uh, the central monitoring site as a target for personal exposure. But uh, the concern is that whether personal exposure is associated with uh, the ambient measure. Now let's the equation. My favorite part. So how personal exposure is associated with the uh, ambient uh, air quality? So ET, basically, that's a personal total exposure, for example, to NO2, personal total exposure. If uh, you, know, you have a monitor to capture NO2 on you, then for you know, the monitor to give it to, to you for a whole day, then the total amount of NO2 capture, that's the total exposure. It has two components. One is the NO2 coming from outside, or you're exposed to NO2 outside, right? The other component, is the NO2 generated <coughs> from not ending sources. E EA means uh, exposure generated from due to uh, ending sources. ENA, that's exposure due to not ending sources. Not ending sources basically is the indoor sources of NO2, for example, natural gas combustion. If people are cooking, you know, that's the, the clean, clean fuel basically will generate a lot of NO2. So that portion is considered as a not ending. Why is it important to distinguish ambient and not ambient? Because the EPA can also can only regulate ambient and not They cannot go into your house and regulate so how you cook. That's the EPA cannot do. So basically, it's quite important to uh, differentiate uh, EA versus uh, ENA. And the EA part is a uh, product of two terms. One is the uh, ambient concentration, CA, concentration ambient. That's the ambient concentration of NO2. And the alpha, that's the, uh, uh, we call that uh, ambient exposure factor. Basically, ambient exposure factor is a uh, function of the personal activity. Y0 is the uh, time fraction that the person spent outside each day. Then uh, it's also a function of how ambient air pollutants, ambient NO2, penetrate into indoor environments. So that's a function of the P, penetration. Penetration is a uh, dimensionless uh, parameter reflecting the probability of ambient NO2 that goes through the shell of this building into the uh, into inside of the building. And the air exchange rate is a, uh, the, with the unit of, uh, uh, per hour. Basically, that's the, uh, within each hour, how many times the air in this room can be exchanged with reflection by outside air. So basically that's the air exchange rate. And K is the decay rate. How NO2 can be can, can get lost in the sea environment through surface reaction, for example. And uh, through surface reaction, then NO2 can turn into a, a more toxic form a nitrous oxide, a nitrous, you know, nitrous, nitrous acid. And uh, the, uh, the P times A times air exchange rate divided by air exchange rate plus the, uh, the uh, decay is called infiltration factor. Reflecting that the uh, infiltration factor ranges from 0 to 1. Basically, that reflects how easy our, uh, the, the probability of uh, ambient NO2 can go into the inner environment and still in the air. So the key, again, as I said, is the, the look at the, the association between personal exposure and ambient concentration measured at the KCCA, for example. Right? So these are factors affecting personal ambient associations. One is the spatial variation, either large-scale spatial variation or small-scale spatial variation. Then onward to equal transport. Easy or not easy, the, what's the fraction of transport into equal environment? If you were sitting here, then basically the air can flow almost free. So basically, all the concentration is almost equal to the concentration. If you're 
if you're sitting in a, in a, in a different environment, for example, um, you know, some shopping mall, you know, they, they have a good uh, filtration system, then mechanical ventilation system, then the indoor concentration you're expecting to be much lower than the And also some exposure factors affecting, for example, personal activity. I spend more time on doors, I spend less time on doors. Or I open windows, close windows. Those activities can also affect personal activity. So this is the paper we published uh, uh, to look at the, the spatial variation of the PM2.5 uh, in the United States. Again, the happy study suggested that uh, with the unit increase of the PM2.5, let's say from 10 to 20, the unit increase, then we observe more death in New York City, uh, right here, than Los Angeles. So basically then people suspect this is because you know, mass concentration is not a good indicator for PM2.5. Then we need to divide the, the, uh, the, the country into uh, east versus west to look at uh, the, the particle, uh, particle composition. The, the, I said the PM2.5 is a mixture. So look at uh, those compositions. Then uh, we did the uh, cluster analysis and uh, look at uh, the uh, 30 major cities in the United States and look at how the cities the similarities of PM2.5 among different cities. Um, although the East versus uh, West contrast exists for some crossbow elements uh, for uh, you know, sulfate nitrate, we observe the uh, stronger uh, North versus uh, South uh, contrast. Northern cities are dominated by combustion related uh, uh, PM2.5, and the Southern cities are dominated by, by dust. So that's a very clear contrast in here. So this basically suggests that, I, I'm not going into the technical details, but after talk, if you'd like to know more, I'll be happy to talk, uh, discuss. So the, the bottom line of this study was that uh, using, if we only use PM2.5 mass concentration, uh, for example, 10 microgram per cubic meter, 20 uh, microgram per cubic meter mass concentration, without looking at the detailed speciation, PM2.5 speciations, whether it's copper, it's iron, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, organic carbon, it's uh, elemental carbon, then that can introduce an exposure error in uh, epidemiological studies. Basically, we're comparing apples versus uh, oranges. And the small scale spatial variation, I'm using another study to illustrate this. This study was sponsored by the US EPA, a deer study. So that's a, a, a you know, it's an exposure study in Detroit, in the northern uh, part of the United States. So in this study, uh, uh, we sampled uh, uh, 140 non-smoking subjects in Detroit. And each subject was followed for two seasons, and each season was followed for five days. When I say follow, I mean we put a bunch of samplers inside their hole, outside their hole, on there, on them. So they have a backpack, they have a, a vest, so attached with a whole bunch of uh, uh, Centers. Then uh, they wear this all the time for five days uh, each season. And also we have a central monitoring site in the community center. So for each person, we have uh, almost two, uh, uh, about two weeks uh, per year measurement. Then look at their association. So this is uh, uh, another equation, the COD. Basically, the, uh, the pairwise concentration, the XIJ, XIK, basically is the, uh, the pairwise for two sides, for example. That's the, the pairwise uh, concentration differences uh, for, uh, for many days. I have uh, two sides, and each side we're uh, measuring operating on a daily basis, then we have uh, many, many days. So this is the, uh, the pairwise differences, and the, this is the pairwise uh, summation. And P is the number of uh, pairs. If I have uh, you know, two sides, only one pair, three sides, uh, uh, three pairs, then you know, four sides, uh, six pairs, so a so number of pairs. That's the COD. COD ranges from zero to one. Zero means there's no spatial variation. Everywhere in Kampala, the concentration is the same. Can only approach zero. Uh, it can be zero. And uh, the, if it's approaching one, basically that means the concentration is quite different, very large, with very large differences. Okay. So the COD can be calculated for each 
chemical species in PM2.5. Then basically the x-axis over each figure is a COD, the y-axis is also COD. This is to compare the, uh, the pairwise COD across different species. Then that means, you know, for PM2.5 mass concentration, very small spatial variation can be observed in the, in the society. But for PM2.5 species, very large variations can be observed. Can be observed. For example, calcium, we expect a high concentration near rural, but uh, you know, in, in the uh, clean area, then basically there's no, no calcium, no resistance. Uh, elemental carbon, we expect a very high concentration close to, for example, trash combustion or trash burning here. But uh, in uh, uh, the uh, some remote area, we don't expect uh, the uh, uh, elemental carbon. So this also means that if we only use PM2.5 mass concentration as a mediator for PM2.5, then that can cause a situation where samples collected from different areas in this community might have different toxicity. Eventually, it's hard to explain if we don't measure all those species. And now we're going to transport. So this basically is the model I just, uh, I just mentioned. Uh, it's uh, the three parameters dominate the Albert Humor transport. One is the, the, the shell, the, the shell of this uh, beauty. Whether it, the, the beauty is uh, tight enough. If it's tight enough, then it's very hard to penetrate. The second thing is that uh, whether we have uh, natural ventilation, when we open doors, open windows. And the third thing is that uh, whether chemicals can be easily deposited or uh, get lost in the indoor environment. It depends on the chemical itself and also depends on the surface to bottom ratio in this room. So, onward to indoor transport, I will use another study to illustrate this. This is called the Riolta study, a relationship of indoor outdoor personal air study, with a similar design as here's, but uh, it's uh, across uh, three different uh, cities, uh, like the uh, uh, three different cities uh, in, in the United States. Basically, uh, uh, we measured indoor and outdoor PM2.5 at the same time for 120 holes. Uh, then uh, in each city, 100 holes in each city, so 300 holes across three cities. Then we pulled the data together. Remember, each hole we measured both indoor and outdoor concentrations at the same time. Then we used a uh, model, it's a uh, physical statistical model called the uh, uh, Positive matrix factorization. Uh, basically, this is a uh, uh, xij is the uh, the i pm two point five species in the j sample that we collected. So basically, that's the uh, xij. Uh, gik fik basically that means the uh, the i species in the uh, k uh, source contribution. There are many sources contribute to pm two point five I collected. Then one thing parameter is the, the source profile. I know the species uh, uh, contribution to each source. And the second thing is that I need to know the source contribution to the PM2.5 mass concentration I collected. So basically two parameters. This model can solve these two parameters simultaneously at the same time. Then this is the, uh, the, the way to minimize that, that error. So basically this is the way to, uh, to the, the optimal uh, function to, to solve this uh, equation. For one example, in uh, New Jersey, um, for outdoor air, we found five different sources. One is the uh, soil, uh, dominated by silicon, uh, calcium, and things like that, so soil. Then the sea soil, since New Jersey is a uh, coastal uh, state, so we see a lot of the sea waves uh, sometimes. Then uh, it's uh, dominated by chlorine or, uh, and sodium. And the secondary aerosol, the uh, Full chemical, you know, in addition to chemical or uh, particles released directly into the atmosphere, since we have a uh, sun, we have uh, you know uh, water in the atmosphere, then chemical reactions can happen in the atmosphere. So it forms uh, a sulfate, forms nitrate, forms a lot of uh, uh, nasty organic compounds in the air. So basically, that's the uh, second reaction. That's uh, uh, dominated by carbon and also uh, by, by sulfur. And mobile source, mobile source, uh, you know, is dominated by elemental carbon. That's uh, the uh, the black carbon. That's the, the 
filter we collected, probably about 20 or so later on, the filter we collected in Hong Kong. It's very dark, like a charcoal, so that's the elemental carbon component you see there. And uh, the uh, combustion uh, with the lead, that's uh, basically it's very likely to be an oil combustion. So for indoor sources, in addition to the outdoor sources we observe, we also observe two indoor sources. Using the uh, then we pulled particles, different particles together. For example, the secondary particle itself is a group. Uh, soil or mechanically generated particle or the, uh, from a sea breeze, from the uh, sea salt, that's a group, mechanically generated. And also combustion, primary combustion that itself is a group. So the three groups, we found uh, three different uh, infiltration factors. So infiltration factor again is the, uh, the percentage of outdoor air goes into the indoor environment and still uh, suspended in the air. So basically that's the, uh, the fraction. So what this means is that uh, the building itself, like the filter, then the air going half through the filter, things will change. Com composition will change. And the composition outside will be different from composition inside. So this is the, uh, the fraction of the outer PM2.5 uh, with uh, three different components. And this is the uh, composition of indoor PM2.5 of outer origin, not indoor PM2.5, but indoor PM2.5 of outer origin. So that means the, the composition uh, changes. The other thing is the, uh, the exposure factors. Um, exposure factors is a uh, quite important uh, concept in exposure assessment. Meaning that uh, uh, all kinds of factors affecting personal exposure. <coughs> so this is the third uh, version of uh, the EPA released uh, exposure factor sample, including what's the age, the population age, what's the uh, the population uh, body weight, what's the uh, the, the population, how much uh, you know fish, what kind of fish you eat each day, what kind of meat. So you, you eat each day. So basically, it contains uh, all kinds of uh, factors affecting personal exposure, not just to air pollution, air pollutants, but also to uh, water, to food, and to, to soil. All kinds of even uh, you know it, it has the parameter uh, characterizing the, how how much soil a kid uh, eat each day. So basically, it has all kinds of information. And this information is free. If you Google EPA exposure factor sample, then you can download that from the internet. And uh, also, uh, this is the, the, the latest uh, version. And uh, because kids behave quite differently uh, from adults, uh, kids are not uh, little adults because they are, you know, the, uh, each day, per body weight, they breathe more air than us. They drink more water than us per body weight. And also, uh, they are still developing. So they, then, you know, they're, they're fragile. It's tender, fragile. So, they're not uh, um, uh, adults. So basically, um, their behavior is also quite different from adults. Then, uh, you know, EPA developed the you know, children-specific uh, exposure factor sample. And also, this is a little Einstein. EPA has been <laughs> talking about um, the, uh, you know, since we have the uh, children-specific exposure factor sample, whether we should have to also have the uh, adult or the uh, elder-specific exposure factor sample. But this is still under discussion and uh, development. So exposure factors, how exposure factors affect uh, uh, human exposure, uh, or the association between, ambient expo uh, between the personal exposure and ambient concentration. I'll just use, uh, again, use the Deere study in Detroit to illustrate this concept.
the smaller close to zero, that means uh, the very weak association. So here, the summer, we got a higher alpha, and the winter, we got a lower alpha. Because in Detroit, it's a very cold city. During the winter, people, most of the time, stay indoors, and close windows, close doors, so won't be exposed much to outer air. So that means uh, the association uh, is uh, uh, weaker. And the, so the difference between these two alpha is statistically, statistically significant. And the same thing is for ozone. And ventilation. Um, whether you know, this home has a uh, central air conditioning, whether this, the, the, this is an old building or this is a new building, the new building usually is uh, more uh, airtight than the old building. And uh, with the central air conditioning then system in the building, usually the building is more airtight. So that means that more airtight means the lower air exchange rate. The air is getting hard to exchange with the outer air. That means uh, the uh, people are getting harder to, to be exposed to outer uh, pollutants. So we expect a lower alpha in this case for uh, newer buildings and for buildings with a central air conditioning system. And personal activity, the same. Whether you open windows, whether you close windows, open doors, close doors. Whether you have air conditioning, that's one thing. Whether you turn it down, that's the other thing. Once you turn down the air conditioning, two things will happen. Right? One is that uh, the, the, the air cools down. The other thing is usually you close window, close door. I haven't seen anybody open window, open door, and let the air conditioning running yet. So basically, that's a, the, once that happens, you reduce air exchange rate. Reducing air exchange rate meaning that uh, you are less likely to be exposed to outer air. Then you expect a lower alpha. And the other thing is uh, meteorological conditions. Meteorological conditions can affect uh, air exchange rate because the uh, air can flow between outside and building, and, and this uh, the uh, between the outside and this uh, this room is because of the pressure difference. The pressure difference can be caused by either wind or by temperature difference. So then it causes a pressure difference, then the air can flow. So the, uh, the, the meteorological condition of temperature difference can definitely affect air flow and affects the, uh, uh, can affect the uh, air exchange rate, affects the, uh, how pollutants penetrate, and affects the, uh, the association between personal exposure and the concentration. In addition to that, Personal activity also, the, uh, the meteorological condition also affects personal activity. When it's rainy days, then people most of the time stand indoors. And if it's very hot, very cold, people stand indoors, high indoors. So, um, it also is interesting to observe this curve. This is the uh, association between the percentage of time spent outdoors versus uh, ambient apparent temperature. Ambient apparent temperature is a combination of temperature and humidity reflects how people feel cold and, 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 and hot. So basically that's the combination. So this is interesting. At uh, uh, 25, around 25 degrees C, then we see a peak in here. Uh, the means the maximize, people maximize their time outdoors, around 25 degrees C. When this goes up or goes down, people spend less time. Um, again, just uh, the, the industry of tax EPA, that's uh, the, the example I, I showed you. Um, then, what EPA can respond? Because the EPA um, needs to review scientific evidence. And I said that there are 1,000 pages for PM for good and better uh, ISA. What can I do? Very likely, if you have uh, 100 studies talking about the health impacts of PM2.5, Maybe uh, you know, 50 tell you positive results, 50 tell you negative results, then who should I trust? So in this case, uh, there's a technique called uh, meta-analysis or quantitative uh, research synthesis uh, can be used. So this is a study uh, I conducted uh, to look at the association between the personal exposure to NO2 versus ambient NO2 concentration across different studies, collectively what can we say? So the, uh, uh, collectively, we can see uh, uh, st still a statistical significant uh, association between the personal exposure and any uh, concentration. Although in review studies, uh, so you know sometimes uh, show negative results, and uh, uh, sometimes the industry people just uh, cherry pick and find those uh, uh, the negative results and say basically this is the, the scientific basis uh, to not to set the national mean. So the, uh, the meta-analysis is also happening. Well, doing uh, 
exposure assessment. Um, you know, in the United States, I took it for granted sometimes. Well, this in Uganda, I'm doing research in China recently. Uh, it's a, a really an eye-opening experience. So the air pollution is not just a, you know, the, the issue in the United States, it's a global issue. Actually, everywhere, all the continents has a, a, a air pollution issue. And here is Uganda. Uganda, these are the, the murky days of Uganda. We, I, I took the picture during the visit. So basically, those are murky days. Clearly, air pollution exists. And also, air pollution also exists in the slum area. Yesterday, uh, Dr. Schwander and I, and also community workers, uh, went into the biggest uh, slum called Nambuango. Nambuango, the slum area, just to go in there and uh, try to do some research in there. And these are the, the settings uh, in, in there. And uh, these are people uh, riding you know, the, the motorcycle, passing through the, the slum. So the, you know, people are burning uh, trash, burning a lot of things in the, in, the, in the swamp as well. So these are the new settings. What shall we do? What can we do? So using the traditional technique or using something else. So I'm very glad that we uh, established a, uh, a good relationship with the engineer so, uh, to develop the uh, uh, a new uh, type of sensor. So it's a low-cost sensor-based uh, 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 sensor technology sensing technology to measure personal exposure. So these are the sensors we're going to use. This is the, uh, the ozone sensor, and this is the, uh, the, uh, this is the ozone sensor, and this is the, uh, the PM sensor. So basically, uh, we're going to use the, uh, the sensor-based technology. Very, we can come, hopefully, later on, we have a very small uh, settings that the people can use. It wouldn't cost more burden. You know, they have uh, more things to struggle already. A lot of things to struggle already. So conducting the study definitely shouldn't increase their burden. That's a uh, consideration. So that's something we, we should consider to miniature this, uh, this the, the sensor. Then uh, uh, this is uh, Arduino-based uh, technology it can transfer data on real-time fashion to cloud. Then basically uh, everyone can access the, the air quality uh, where you are. So basically that's the, the idea. Okay. Uh, and hopefully this can be uh, achieved within uh, uh, <laughs> a year, half a year, something like that, so a short period of time. So uh, in the future, uh, this is going to be a product for uh, And these are the, the sensors we're testing, the, the same sensor when we tested uh, in New Jersey, those uh, settings um, under different um, conditions. So the concluding remarks. Um, Exposure assessment is a key for setting national ambient air quality standards. The, uh, the major concern of exposure assessment is the, uh, how reliable ambient concentration is an indicator or survey for personal exposure. So the personal ambient association is determined by spatial variation by indoor level transport and also, also by various personal activities and uh, exposure factors. And uh, uh, new concepts and technologies uh, provide the new opportunities to face uh, new challenges. So I'd like to uh, thank my colleagues at EPA, University of Chapel Hill, and uh, Rutgers University, then the real study uh, participants and leaders study <coughs> And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Kaway, today, for that talk. I think you can stand out with your talk. And the members of EPA have some questions for us. So, so maybe some questions first for this because mine is really very different. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe ask any questions for Dr. May. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. I will talk about uh, the exploration between air pollution, nanoparticles, and tuberculosis. And this first image shows a 15,000 year old cave painting uh, from Spain. A man who is climbing up on a tree and tries to use smoke to get bees out of their hive to collect the honey. So humans have been exposed to smoke for millions, of thousands of years. And this article that appeared in the New York Times actually refers to a study that discusses whether the early sitting around or 
human ancestors of fires, probably provided an environment in which microbacterium tuberculosis could be transmitted <coughs> easily because people were sitting close together, they were coughing because of smoke inhalation, and may have in that context already started transmitting uh, the microbacteria to each other. I'm talking about the connection between particles and the immune system and the uh, ability of the immune system to respond appropriately to microbacterium tuberculosis. I should briefly say that I worked in Kampala in 1992-1993 at the Joint Clinical Research Center that at that time was at Lengo and uh, worked on HIV-related um, tuberculosis and have since then come back to Kampala quite often and noted that the air quality really had changed a lot. So in 2012, we brought back a simple PM monitor and positioned it in a house um, in, in the Karagrip region, a region near Gayaza Road, and did our first assessment that led to the first ever paper in Uganda on air quality. Okay. I would like to uh, just recognize the many groups of people I've been working with in this field, both at Rutgers, at uh, the Environmental Health Science Institute at Rutgers, and much of my work that I will present to you has been done in Mexico City. I have been working in Mexico City uh, now for um, basically as long as I've been working in uh, Uganda since 1994, um, and there are a lot of colleagues involved uh, at Duke uh, in Michigan, and this has been done with funding from the National Institutes of Health in the uh, US. Just joined a few of the people, this is my lab, in the good days when I had money. <laughs> and these are folks uh, in Mexico City who fortunately can work with uh, fixed salary lines and don't have to bring in the money through grants that we have to do. And I want to remind you of tuberculosis. I guess you all know that tuberculosis is a major health problem in this country. And at least in the US, one has to remind people that tuberculosis is a disease that is important in the context of the poverty and disability. And to control TB, so the determinants of TB need to be controlled as well as proximate risk factors that then translate into um, uh, biological consequences. This is an interesting slide showing the development of the tuberculosis epidemic in these three European cities, London, Stockholm, and Hamburg, uh, between 1750 and 1950, a time when there were no antibiotics. The antibiotics were developed in the 50s, actually, at the Waxman Institute at our university. Uh, the first drug, streptomycin, was developed at Rutgers, basically. But the frequency of the disease events or mortality caused by TB, uh, uh, yeah, by tuberculosis, reduced long before ever biomedical interventions could be done. And it is important to know that basically this was due to social, political, and economic uh, changes. And we see that wars can uh, bring up um, the frequency of tuberculosis cases, the mortality for brief periods, but the overall trend was uh, a downward one before actually an uh, institutionalization of medications. You know that uh, tuberculosis is primarily a problem in the sub-Saharan African countries and Southeast and Southeast Asia. And um, clearly the burden of tuberculosis fall, follows a strong socioeconomic uh, gradient and the poorest have the highest risk of getting infected and of having the infection progress to tuberculosis. And there are multiple factors involved in this. Obviously, the direct exposure to infectious droplet nuclei that contain the microbacteria that are released from patients with TB during coughing, speaking, or singing. Obviously, living in communities with high prevalence, <coughs> and obviously, crowding and, and lack of uh, air exchange are very important. And as you all know, HIV is a major contributor via the We also know that indoor air pollution, that is fossil fuel smoke, and production, consumption of alcohol, the presence of diabetes, and other diseases, including depression, that can contribute to reducing the immune response such that tuberculosis can be lost. When you look at uh, the components that contribute to increased 
Thema von 2009, wenn du weiter durch den Spruchstück mentions Tobacco, Smoke and Air Pollution as potential contributing factors to our inner motion response. As Dr. Mong indicated earlier, air pollution now is a major risk factor for global death and the worst exposures are in low and middle income countries, developing world countries where the uh, disproportionate burden of acute and chronic respiratory infections that we now in the context of our work for tuberculosis show is related to air pollution. As Dr. Mong also mentioned, Together, 7 million deaths are estimated to be related to air pollution, 1 in 8 global deaths, and uh, uh, about half uh, attributable to ambient air pollution and half to household air pollution. And many, many cities worldwide are now reporting air pollution. The connection between tobacco exposure, smoking, and tuberculosis has been quite well established. I will show you uh, the preparation for meta-analysis that we are going to do that looks at tobacco smoking, also and and the likelihood of development of tuberculosis. So there's very good evidence that uh, tobacco smoking leads to an excess of uh, tuberculosis cases in enormous numbers of countries with large populations such as India and even environmental smoke, second-hand smoke exposure in children Thank you. 
strong evidence from household air pollution exposures uh, that they uh, lead to significantly increased risk for TB development and acquisition of the infection with COVID 19. And there is emerging evidence for ambient air pollution exposures that may do the same, same thing. You are not uh, probably apart from a few who are environmental field experts on microbiome exposures, and you should know a few things. So, to understand what I'm talking about, it is a pathogen that has to lift its cells. It induces a major broad immune response that apparently can be protective. That is the reason why so many people can live with the bacteria in their system without getting disease. So the immune response can suppress MTB or keep it in shape until obviously it breaks down for multiple reasons and then the bacterial there. Most often the disease is in the lungs because we inhale the bacteria and um, there are um, mechanisms in place against the microbiome tuberculosis from the immune response that are not fully understood. That is why we have to have a vaccine. You, you know BCG, you may be all infected and vaccinated with BCG. BCG is, um, however, not a good vaccine that protects adults and uh, it has primarily good effects on neonates and prevents uh, dissemination of infection in, in young kids, but in adults we don't have a good uh, vaccine. This is just to remind you that the inhalation process um, of particles uh, selects all the particles by different sizes and uh, Dr. Monk had already mentioned um, that the small particles can um, penetrate deeper into the lung than the large particles that can on their way into the lung in the uh, nasal and uh, in the upper frontal uh, area. Now, why did I become interested in tuberculosis in the context of air pollution? This is the work that we've done in Mexico City. Actually, um, this is an important uh, medical intervention where uh, a tube is inserted into the lungs that uh, allows the formation of saline fluid and basically the washing of the lung segments. And uh, when you do this and then look at the cells that come out there, you have bronchoalveolar cells that consist primarily of large macrophages. These are the cells that phagocytose uh, particles and bacteria and are involved in the immune response, in the regulation of the immune response uh, against whatever they are taking up. What we noted when we counted the cells was that some of these macrophages looked dark and uh, clearly contained pollutant material. And although at that time we had really different questions, we were comparing the lung response of TB patients and the health of people, we always found that what uh, the particles would do to the ability of the cells to deal with microbiome tuberculosis. And now obviously this is a complicated slide for people who are not in the biological field. The main message here is that these macrophages, which are uh, symbolized here, um, are in the center of uh, communications with other cells. And the uh, other cells are lymphocytes that uh, also exist in the other spaces. They are recruited from the bloodstream, they go to where the infection is, and then there is an interaction between these macrophages and the lymphocytes. And an immune response is induced that should take care of microbiome tuberculosis. For example, by these cells that contain microbacteria tuberculosis being killed by these lymphocytes that uh, 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 gather around the microbacteria. And there are multiple um, products produced from these cells that we can measure in the, in the culture system. Um, for example, when we simplify these um, complex interactions and uh, put different cell types together in a cell culture, and then, for example, infect these cells with cell culture and expose them at the same time to particles. And then you can measure some of these important cytokines. These are basically proteins released by the cells that make other cells do things. So these are communication uh, products um, that orchestrate the immune response. And you can measure this in the uh, laboratory. So the first thing we did was we looked at diesel exhaust particles. Diesel exhaust particles are the things that you inhale every day when you drive behind the cattle or uh, behind your unfortunately unregulated trucks that uh, can smoke uh, big plumes of black stuff in the air. Um, this diesel exhaust has recently been classified as carcinogen. It contributes uh, majorly to uh, air pollutant in urban environments and these particles have been used in the standard form generated by diesel engines to do um, and, um, Studies like 
see that the mice with post cognitive particles lose their ability to control the heat, so there would be more microbial tuberculosis in their lungs and they would succumb. So these soft particles are bad, and these are vulnerable, and these were experiments now with cells that we uh, took to create this case for my own blood. These are blood monocytes that we exposed to bring particles. And we see a few here the arrows and to microbial tuberculosis, these red rocks. And by electron microscopy, you see here the uh, bacteria and then here the particle. And, and we were able to show that both particles and bacteria are taken up in the same cells. And that some of the functions, particularly interferon gamma, a very important cytokine in controlling the infection against microbial tuberculosis. that the 
has more than one sun in the century, 20 years in the week, but they are also not close enough to the residences of our uh, um, subjects. Um, these are the parameters that we look at in Europe, so metabolites from um, diesel, including um, diesel and other capital components that can be measured in Europe. And in the laboratory now, we are trying to assess how particle exposure in, in, in affects the immune cell functions that we are interested in. So a simplified, simplified model of what happens in an alveolus in the lungs, you know, the lungs are basically this, this inverted tree of, of, of uh, <coughs> airways that lead to this much like uh, little alveoli where the oxygen um, uptake occurs and the uh, CO2 These alveoli are aligned with cells, they're called epithelial cells, that are basically creating like the wallpaper of these spaces. And they interact with the cells that I showed you earlier with macrophages and with lymphocytes. So, in the first attempt, we use the cell line that uh, represents these lining cells and we expose them to microtin tuberculosis. You can see microtin tuberculosis show up in these cells. We expose them also to particles. Here PM2.5 and here PM10, different shapes. And we see these particles appear in these cells together with the microtin tuberculosis. So again, these respiratory cells can take up particles as well as microtin tuberculosis. So this was the first observation by electron microscopy. And then we also look um, obviously at the function of these cells. And let me just tell you that they're peptides proteins produced by these cells that help to kill infectious agents, both viruses as well as bacteria, they're called uh, human better defenses. They are very evolutionary, very old uh, proteins that exist on frog skin, help them to be uh, alive in the dirty ponds. We have them in our respiratory systems, we have them in the guts. And the upshot of this slide is that when we add these particles from the air, and we can confide in increasing doses, we saw an increase in the capacity of the cells to produce these antimicrobial peptides. And we also saw that these cells lose their capacity in increasing doses of particles to control the growth of MPV. So we can infect the cells and then watch how they can control MTB growth. When we add these particles, this growth significantly increases. So the cells significantly lose their capacity. We found out that the addition of these particles brings the cells in a state called senescence, uh, which is not yet there, but uh, not functional. So the particles change the ability of the cells to respond to TB, uh, uh, both by reducing the human better defense in production as well as the TB control. And um, that led us then to the next question how do these particles affect lung blood mononuclear cells that are not the cells? that are in the middle of the alveoli and not in the bloodstream. And um, I hope this continues. Okay. So these, these are so-called cytospins. We're taking cells out of the lungs, put them in a special uh, centrifuge, and basically uh, centrifuge them onto glass slides. So we can stain the cells and then look at them through the microscope. And what we see here, or what you see, Cells that come directly out of the lungs of people that live in Mexico City. And you see that these cells here contain dark inclusions, right? Particles. These are conglomerates of particles. So that is from normal breathing, nothing else than normal living in Mexico City. The lung cells that I showed you come out through the washing process contain particles. And we can uh, magnify these cells in a, in, a, in a microscope and then have a software that can come out. Particles, so we can determine the area of the particles that covers the cells. And uh, then uh, what we did is we correlated the area of the cells covered by the particles and we correlated the number of cells that contain particles um, with um, the, uh, in, in different uh, subjects. And we can show that a large proportion of people has. Macrophages containing particles between 25 and 60 percent, and that up to 6 
black, which is an inert uh, carbon material, elemental carbon, that has the same size and shape of these particles, we could not observe such an uh, appearance. So the characteristics of the material matter in terms of whether nanoparticles, the small particles, can confer toxicity or not. The shape alone is not responsible. It is clearly the size, we've seen that, but also electrical charge. I'm not going into that in much detail. Uh, we, we understand the mechanism, and there are some uh, uh, cellular products that are upgraded in the exposure of the silver uh, that uh, contribute to the change in the ability of the cells to respond to an MTE. And we are obviously looking at uh, in the immunology, we're looking not only at how cells work in a signaling mechanisms and uh, one of the proteins that are upregulated is a sheet neutral protein 72 that we only found upregulated with silver nanoparticle exposure, not the carbon black, that seems to be interfering in the signaling pathways such that the TB microtin tuberculosis cannot induce the uh, required host response. What is interesting though that the particle effects <coughs> when you model the respiratory surface seem to be seem to be modified by the, the, the presence of surfactant. Surfactant is a naturally occurring protein in our galleries. For example, if you have a premature uh, born baby with 500 to 1000 gram, small, small, very early units, they don't have the surfactant in their lungs are collapsed. So surfactant is an surface active protein that lines the alveolar spaces like wallpaper sitting on these respiratory cells. And it's basically the first contact site between what you inhale and, and the, the human body. When we interact, when we add the surfactant in increasing doses, we see a decrease in the ability of the nanoparticles to cause the damage. So basically saying that some of our in vitro work has its weaknesses to model what really happens. So um, I guess that's an important thing with biomedical sciences, that we always model things and that, that this may not necessarily represent the real world situation. Um, I was also just to touch on this, <coughs> try to show you these uh, specific <coughs> electron microscopy images. I don't know if you're able to see them, but these are um, microtium tuberculosis in the lung and um, the surrounding so we have exposed these cells to MTB and to silver nanoparticles, and they find their way to MTB. <coughs> there is obviously a possibility implied here that the silver nanoparticles could be used to treat MTB. Um, and I'll show you a little bit later um, where we're going. So uh, it may be important to assess the balance between the good and the bad here. So nanoparticles may also have therapeutic implications going forward in the context of infection control. I wanted to summarize here, so silver nanoparticles but not carbon black that can suppress and be used host responses um, and uh, via the upregulation of vitro protein section 2. That's a fact in this protein in the alveolar spaces and suppress this um, suppression basically. Um, but there's the option also to And that is um, here an image where you see nanoparticles uh, naturally uh, sitting on the membrane of the bacteria. So this is, this is the bacteria. And they uh, 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 attach to the bacteria and seem to uh, change the uh, bacterial uh, surface. They seem to penetrate <coughs> and seem to alter uh, the microtial membrane. within the bacteria, so this is the bacteria, so they go into the bacteria and only <coughs> see the membrane that go into it, implying that uh, there may indeed be a way to um, use these particles. <coughs>
slide showing <coughs> um, publication frequencies uh, in different areas of um, in different fields of, of uh, interest. And this is, for example, malaria. So there are a lot of publications coming out of Africa. This is uh, uh, publications related to to, uh, to Africa. There is very little known in Sub-Saharan Africa about air quality. And um, when we saw this, um, as I told you, we started going to a paragraph that uh, did two 24 hour samples. These are the filters that before used. This is 24 hours later. Um, this is how these filters looked like. And that was 18 meters off Kayata Road in a residential setting. And um, this is the sample system that we currently have running here at Bandiria Lab. Because we are interested now in how these particles can be removed them from the filters, can or cannot do the changes uh, that I showed you earlier in cell culture systems. Um, this led to the first paper um, ever on uh, the ambient air pollution uh, in, in Kampala. Um, this is a day with bad air, a day with good air, and the, the main component of the particle was soil material. So some of the the problems uh, that uh, may be related to the particle butter misinvention <coughs> is uh, probably due to uh, the lack of paint growth uh, and the lack of greenery. The more people who use greenery or the growth of the thing, the little shrubs, uh, the harder the more difficult it is. And we have done also a second study that was much more comprehensive, that was with Bruce Kiranga here from Macquarie University. Department of Pulmonary Medicine and that looked at um, the ginger and kampala and uh, in both cases um, we found um, increased particulate matter levels going beyond the NAC standard that Dr. Mong was talking about. But this was also a short-term study and clearly we need to do a study in, in, in a larger area and longitudinally and the system that Dr. Mong engineer are working on may allow us to uh, produce sufficient small uh, low cost uh, sensor systems that we can distribute them and uh, run longer experiments or longer studies in our power. That's basically my final conclusion. And you can say that, that the exposure of immune cells or our host defense system to particular matter adversely affects their ability to control microchemical glucosis. That one can maybe infer from that that uh, this may have important public health complications. Uh, obviously, not necessarily for the individual, but for, for, for populations. And clearly, one needs uh, more studies, maybe the type of study we consider for uh, uh, another one group, uh, or clearly epidemiological population based studies that need to correlate air quality parameters with infection rates or TB rates. If one is interested in TB, I also think this may be important for HIV. There were also studies done already about 15 years ago uh, where the smokers uh, have shown that uh, this tobacco smoke exposure increases the replication of HIV in the lungs. And that it leads to a broader variety of HIV causing species. And there are also studies showing that smoking can increase drug resistance. Um, and I think all these are really research questions that one should look into um, could and the RT become a bigger problem the So I think there's a lot of uh, aspects to study. Obviously in the Namuongo context when we looked around yesterday we were really asking how can we study the single impact of air pollution in an environment where kids fetch water from the sewage. Basically we saw literally kids uh, digging water out of holes that you would not really want to use to clean your house. And in such an environment where helmets are obviously a major problem, you know, helmets reduce the immune response against TB. You know now that diabetes in is increasing. We met several people in that stuff uh, with diabetes. So 
lobbyists in the industry become here that likes to fly under the radar of regulation. That's why they're coming. And um, I understand that's a political statement that the government must be interested in getting investment, but uh, not at the price of the population. That's it. Thank you very much.
be a good business event that you indeed you forget us. On behalf of the participants here, we would like to thank you and convey our greetings to your awesome institution. We hope you enjoy your stay here. If you have time, feel free to come.